afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure being uh, with you today. I am Kevor Kagopcian, the program manager for the Kaisit International Fellows Program, and it's uh, our privilege to welcome you all to the second webinar of a series of webinars that, uh, addressing the role of religions uh, in addressing COVID-19. Throughout this webinar, we try to understand and highlight the role religious institutions, religious leaders, faith-based organizations can play in addressing uh, the COVID-19 and the ongoing crisis. In other ways, in other words, how religions respond by helping to prevent the spread of the virus and supporting those in need. Today, it's our privilege to have three brilliant speakers from the two sides of the world where I sit right now in Vienna, one from the very uh, west where I sit, Rabbi Marcelo Batar from Argentina, and two other brilliant colleagues from the east, from India and Pakistan, Subhi Dupar from uh, India and uh, Shahid Rahmat from Pakistan. Before we start the session, I would like to remind all of us about a couple of house rules. So we stick to these rules throughout the session to ensure a um, uh, smooth uh, webinar. So the first one, please be reminded that the presentation will be followed by a Q&A, question and answer sessions. We will gather all the questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to ask questions, please type it and send, send them to us. If you would like to direct them to a specific speaker, please indicate as such. Then, please be informed that we will record and publish this webinar. So in case you need to leave early or you want to revisit a section or share it with friends or relevant colleagues within your community, please do so by visiting our website and particularly Dialogue Knowledge Hubs section. To move on, the third house rule that we would like to mention or highlight is the fact that currently online resources are all over the world heavily used. Please be patient with us in case there are technical challenges and my colleagues in the background will do their best to address your challenges. And before um, uh, moving forward and intro introducing our speakers, I would like to invite you to introduce yourself as well, um, to, to introduce yourself as well via uh, the chat box by giving your name, maybe where you come from, the institution that you work for, or a brief introduction about yourself. So without further delay, let me check how many people we have with us. We already have four people with us. Without further delay, I would like to start uh, presenting our first speaker, who will be Shahid Rahmat from uh, Pakistan. Shahid is... Keyford, we can't hear you. I know that I'm muted. Hello. Working in the field of interfaith harmony. I will put the long CV of Shahid Rahmat in the chat, so we give him more time to deliver his presentation. Shahid, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Kefo, uh, for this wonderful opportunity and uh, uh, for this very important webinar on these uh, difficult time, like which which nobody experienced in the modern history, and uh, the what the work we are doing that's really important. Uh, so I would really uh, appreciate the effort, the giving the opportunity to share with others, colleagues. So my name is Shahid, and I am uh, founder and executive director of Youth Development Foundation. So the Youth Development Foundation, it's a youth-led organization uh, 
uh, which founded back in 2010 from a small room and with the, the bunch of friends from different faith, they, they start thinking about that, that how we can contribute and how we can make this interfaith harmony work and this uh, discussions uh, uh, about different faith, not the theological, but on how we can develop a common um, commonalities, how we can develop a table fellowship and how we can become friends, how we can take uh, collective actions and uh, without uh, doing something which uh, uncomfortable for other faith youngster. And then we started and uh, uh, doing small, small activity in the, in the Lahore city of Pakistan and then the uh, when the youth the we started from diversity tours and youth started this our initiative in diversity tours we giving exposure to youngster uh to to become part of our uh, the one day trip to the different uh, religious places and then we gave him or her exposure to getting the first hand information from other faiths and try to find out the commonality the try to understand the differences as well and then come up with the idea that how we can bridge the gap between so from 12 2010 to till now like it's our ideas our all interfaith gatherings activities are warmly welcomed by the youngster and we like we were uh, able to make an impact of more than 12 the over 12000 uh, youngster in last 10 years and working from lahore to the uh, 30 more districts in three provinces of Pakistan. So it was a huge accomplishment for us that the people, the young people, they start becoming partners for us and becoming stakeholders of this initiative or this movement. And it, uh, from last couple of years, the government is also open its door for us and they take us as a board member for their provincial youth councils. And uh, uh, they uh, they gave us opportunity to draft a first ever pol interfaith policy for the whole Punjab province in Pakistan. So it's uh, the great um, uh, uh, the feeling to share all these uh, achievements and um, uh, talking with my fellow friends that how we started this and how we uh, uh, like now moving forward and working with the government we started from ground actions, so activating youngsters, giving them a small uh, uh, stipends so they, ha they can take their own initiatives. And now we are moving to working, supporting to the government also to take uh, to to increasing the impact of. So here are the few slides which I quickly would like to share with the, our viewer. So this is a picture of Youth Development Foundation One Diversity Camp in which we, we, we have three stream of youth and students from one from university students from different departments and then we have a community student, youth from different religion and then we have a madrasa students also part of this. So three streams we put them together for three days in a the retreat center in a hill station and there they, they learn about the the, how the, the conflicts, they try to understand, they try, uh, we teach them or we visit, facilitate them to identify conflict and try to come up with uh, the indigenous solution for all these uh, conflicts. So they learn conflict mitigation strategies, con conflict identification, non-violence communication, and then they draft their own social actions, which means they, when they go back to their reality, we will support them with a small amount so they have to do something in their university back in their uh, community and back in their uh, uh, madrasas so how they can develop these exchanges so as i explained to you as a youth-led very young organization we started working back in 2010 and we were able to to host or to organize uh, the biggest gathering of uh, diversity celebration in the and uh, the scene of another province of Pakistan where we we see more than thousand people from different faith and there was a cultural activities religious activities so well, these speeches belongs to that so 
if i go and uh, how we increase our outreach like our our focus is to go to the the conflicts areas the no go areas where people are thinking that interfaith is a very sensitive topic and they they just ignoring uh, all these conflicts and try to live with them but we we uh, getting the students on board and try to educate them and give them skills so the how they can uh, they how they can uh, develop a solution for that and that's develop a sustainable solution for that problem and try to mitigate in a peaceful way so we the more uh, most of the district are here the, the post conflict communities so where the conflict happened somewhere uh, and conflict happened between religions uh so as i here i just want to give you the snapshot of our 10 years peace building um uh impact that over 12000 youngster we try to engage in 24 in the post conflicts districts and uh, we organized the uh, more than uh, like the still our diversity camps are going on and uh, so it's the diversity camp for religious tolerance then we have the more than 110 interfaith exchanges where the different students like university students invited the the religious institute the madrasa students to to come and visit the university and spend one day with them the how they spend life and try to reduce the gap between what they are thinking that the university students are doing something else and the uh, the university students are thinking that they all these religious youngsters they are intolerant they are extremist and they so it's just to and then we uh, were able to 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 fund and support the, the more than uh, 385 social action projects with small initiatives like we give them um around 200 dollars but they have to do something innovative in the university community online offline so something which uh, they can multiply their skills which we uh, you know, engage them a whole year and we try to give them a skills and then we expect that they have to multiply that and the the, the proud moment for me is that we were The, the able to engage the female from all these conflict zones so more around 4580 females and mostly are the young girls <clears throat> sorry so it was a huge uh, like a support from the community that the females are also coming forefront and they 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 getting engaged with with these kind of which previous was very uh limited because the females are limited to their houses and they are not allowed to take all these sensitive issues and try to work on, on all these sensitive topics so uh, now we i just jumped to how we are connecting our this work from a grassroots to university to the community and con- uh, supporting to the government or the broader level like uh, there is a uh, the, on a national level uh, uh special advisor to prime minister of pakistan on youth affairs so we are connected with that and we uh, we quarterly we go and meet that uh, advisor to prime minister and we just present our report and we are reporting them on government and just uh, 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 developing a scenario in which we supporting the government and we expect the government will give us a space to work with all these individual on a grassroots level or on a national level and um, uh if i go to our the the objectives are uh, very simple like how we can engage youngsters how we can inspire them how we can activate them and how we can support them to develop their own sustainable conflict mitigation strategies and how they can make their communities more accept accepting others tolerant to others and a sustainable peaceful solution to their own small small problems so uh if i come to just jump to the situation right now which is the covid 19 so this this is a very unfortunate like our all activities are suspended from last couple of months and we cannot do more interfaith harmony gathering no interfaith diversity camp no social action project so keeping the government policies on social distancing 
but we came up with the idea like how we can support this in this scenario in this difficult situation like we have more than 12000 youngster alumni who are the different part of the pakistan how we can activate them how they can perform in this scenario how we can use their own skills and their expertise so we have started a dedicated communication campaigns that's uh, combating post covid outbreak anti sectarian narratives in which like a lot of narrative of the hate speech is going on on social media on offline like people associating this covid 19 to the people here in pakistan especially people are associating this problem to some other religion but in sects and communities like they become a so major source for this transmission and they uh, get the uh, spreading this virus because they travel to somewhere else and they going to hold a religious gathering here and the people start uh, spreading this hate speech to, to target that small minorities whom are already vulnerable so we come up with the idea like how we can respond to this how we can compact this like this going to be another disaster for the community if the people start hate speeching so the community whole community start uh, uh, hating to them so then it would be another uh, the, the challenge like what the work we are doing from last five uh, ten years like making the communities more ex uh, uh, let that uh, they accept each other they tolerate and they they celebrate our diversity and they they taking it at the strength and how we together as an equal citizen can come up with the ideas that we can make this uh, country prosperous, how we can contribute in the development of this country and how we can live peacefully and sustainably and we can contribute in the development of it. So we we taking this as a threat to that narrative which we are trying to build in the last 10 years, almost a decade. So we start going to start a dedicated communication strategy campaigns in which we're going to engage up all religious leaders and uh, community leaders and uh, celebrities from uh, different communities so they're going we're going to record their message and then going to broadcast their messages with the help of the government using the government channels and they're going to that's the messages would be on online on the all mainstream medias on on social media and we're going to post some the billboards some posters so it would be a huge campaign in the in the whole province and uh, in this way like on the cable channels on the radios so we we expecting that this would give them uh, a chance to listen to their leaders the community leaders so religious leaders of the, because they are so much inspired them. All these religious leaders which we are going to engage, they, they have a lot of following in the community. So in this way, they, they can, and they can aware to their uh, followers that we, this is a disaster, this is a, uh, a crisis. So we have to perform as a community, as a one nation, rather than focusing on our differences. And we have to focus on how we can survive and how we can to help each other to face these kind of challenges and the secondly like our youngsters our particularly our muslim youngsters uh, the alumni they and that's uh, the campaign we started that's uh, the livelihood campaign and that's the name is shared they'll say it's been shared by heart so it's a sense of belongings to each other so our muslim volunteers are collecting uh, uh, the grocery and giving to the, the minority family and uh, providing this livelihood support to them because they are the through uh, because of the lockdown they are on a vulnerable situation because mostly the minorities communities are related to the daily wages worker so because of the lockdown they are taxi driver rickshaw drivers they are doing they are doing a minimum of work and because of the lockdown they are affecting they are one problem is the COVID-19 and the second problem is that uh, they are dying because of the hunger. And so our Muslim volunteers, they are promoting the, this, uh, this spirit of belonging to each other and they collect things, uh, all these foodable items and uh, providing to all the needy family and how we can sustain that 200 families in this um, more 15 days lockdown in this whole month. 
and then there is a lot of things are happening from the government there the third uh, which we just appointed as a board member for the punjab youth volunteer task force for the corona relief facilitation program which is the initiative of prime minister of pakistan so we as a board member we going to inspire our all alumni so they can help people how they can register because the most of the uneducated people they cannot register they cannot approach to the government so how they can get the benefits which government is relief efforts which government is going to give them a cash or the other the items so our volunteers are going to support them they, how they can safely register with the because a lot of frauds are happening on the name of the government so our volunteers can identify people and they can help to apply safely and then they get all the benefits which government is going to do and the thirdly like our volunteers or our alumni they are a lot of alumni are as a frontliner they work in the in the security of the, like in the police in the hospitals and and other other areas and they in the in the universities or uh, so they we sharing their uh stories by documenting video stories and the sharing that how, how how we are supporting in this time to our communities and they also promoting the people should stay safe stay at home and they 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 promoting the social distancing campaign which is the government running on a very larger level so these four initiatives right now we are uh running in this uh, covid 19 situation and this is the cross wave like our we are the diverse with volunteers they working together and so it's the great spirit of how uh, and uh, interfaith harmony can uh, work together and in the time of difficulty and how we can promote the sense of belonging to each other as one nation as a one family thank you very much thank you very much I assume you hear me. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much, Shahid, for your uh, very constructive presentation. And it seems next year you are going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of uh, YDF. Am I correct? Since you you were established uh, in 2001, and uh, I would like 2010. So 2010. Yeah, so. so it was Okay, then the tenth anniversary it will be next year. So congratulations from now, and I would like to congratulate you on the uh, publication of the first interfaith policy uh, in the Panjam region, and for the twelve thousand youth uh, that you have graduated in your peace building uh, activities within twenty four districts, and when it comes to the actions or the campaigns that you have been involved with in terms of addressing covid-19 you highlighted four four uh, initiatives the first one is basically a communication campaign so to address the uh, um, anti covid-19 discourse and the second one is livelihood campaign you called it share disease in which your muslim alumni raising awareness within the community and providing uh, relief services etc the third one is that um, you have been appointed as a board member in the punjab uh, youth volunteer task force and you are coordinating with the authorities to be a, b a bridge between the authorities and the grassroots and the fourth one your alumni uh, as their professions uh they are contributing to combat uh, the covid-19 and uh, by their messages by their positive uh, messages they are trying to keep the momentum high and uh, addressing the crisis as much as possible so thank you for that and uh, uh, as i said in the beginning of the webinar we will have a specific section to raise questions and get answers from our speakers at the end of the uh, presentations by our three you're mute hear me now you hear me now okay and we move to our second um, speaker 
our only female speaker of today's webinar, Subhi Dupar from India. Subhi, she is the regional director for the, uh, for the United Religions Initiatives based in India. She is a peace educator and trainer who works to promote interfaith harmony and religious inclusion among people of diverse cultures. Without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Subhi. Please, Subhi. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody who is watching me out there. Uh, so we all have been like taking in a lot these days, you know, viewing on our screens. So I would actually like to hear from you before I start my presentation. Um, so if you could all quickly write one word in the chat box of how you were feeling, um, I love to hear it from you because you've all been talking and my hope is that we will, um, you know, that I'd love to share what we are doing and maybe also ignite some hope. So in the chat box, if you could quickly write down maybe one word um, about how you're feeling today. So we have some responses, enlightened, excited. This is amazing, um, inspired, awesome, great. This is nice, creative. Um, I'm also excited and a little nervous. Um, yes, I am super happy to see you all as well. I mean, I like technically, I wish I could be there with you, but like, this is really, really nice. Um, so am I feeling great? Thank you so much all for being here. This is great energy. You're actually also, um, motivating me to do like, you know, the best that I can. Feeling like a social worker. Yes, I am also definitely feeling like a social worker. I uh, feel that I've been working more in, during this lockdown uh, in comparison to my other normal days. So yes, um, you know, with all this motivation and energy that I am getting, I will uh, start my presentation. So I'd like to share my screen. Okay. So yes, um, before uh, we start with all this motivation, I know a lot of you are doing a lot of things out there. And, uh, you know, it's just like people like you who are a part of uh, URI. URI is the organization that works in 109 countries, United Religions Initiative. And we have 23 regional offices around the world. Um, I am the regional director for one of the uh, zones, which is North India and Afghanistan. Um, we uh, are spread with uh, we are the largest grassroots interfaith movement and as you can see uh, know your uri uh, it is you are i which is all of you together make this institution um, we are basically a global grassroots interfaith network that cultivates peace and justice by engaging people to bridge religious and cultural differences and work together for the good of the community. As I mentioned, we uh, are spread all over and we are a large movement of interfaith peace builders like you um, who are making a difference today around the world. Uh, our members of cooperation circles are basically role models. They are the ones who, um, you know, embody the spirit of interfaith harmony and uh, uh, you know bring about sustainable effective peace building so before we i get into how we are doing um, uh, you know work related to covid-19 i would just simply want to quickly take you around with how do we make this whole process uh, sustainable and effective in such a way that around the year uh, and for almost 20 years since uh, URI uh, has been in existence. Um, 
we have cooperation circles which have members like you and each cooperation circle has minimum of seven people with three different religious faith backgrounds and when i say faith it includes caste class ethnicity uh, indigenous traditions atheistic atheist agnostic humanist universalist everybody so a minimum of seven people uh, come together to work for the good of the society the idea is that in today's world when religion is seen with so much of skepticism there's fear there is um, a lot of questions around it we basically bring together people from all different faith backgrounds to address a social problem and the idea is that based on relationships rather than on the on you know very um uh obvious thing of resources instead of we make this transition where is people uh, connecting on their passion on what they would want to see like on the idea of um a better world people come together and work for the good of the society so while they are coming together they are also coming across their differences they are also coming across their similarities so it's not just tolerance but it's also acceptance and celebration of the diversity and um you know this is how our each cooperation circle um functions and similar to the sdgs we also have 14 action areas which include health environment um youth empowerment uh, um mitigation uh, peace and reconciliation uh, women empowerment child care so on and so forth so across 14 action areas people come together and work for the good of the society and it is because of these reasons that uh, today we hold um, a, a statutory status at the ecosoc we were also selected by the united nations alliance of civilization as one of the most innovative and successful grassroots initiatives uh, we also uh, are having a standing committee um, and representation at several un offices um as i said what we do does uri have a mandate to say you have to do xyz things no we basically provide a a broader platform for peace builders like you to come together and um and bond with people who are from different faith communities around issues that matter to you something that you are passionate about so we basically um you know uh unite all of our combined resources uh only for non violent compassionate action to awaken our deepest truth and to manifest love and justice amongst people uh and all life forms on earth so uh with this um you know we at this point in time when the entire humanity um the human kind is facing this kind of a pandemic where a lot of people are saying that it's like a reboot button um we are not just promoting the idea of um social distancing but we're also talking about soul connecting and soul connecting in a way that brings people together to even stand by uh, each and every one who is facing the effects um very differently and uh, in you know in much more uh, unimaginable ways so we're trying to help and support communities we are trying um to build a space where people with all of their uh, skills with all of their resources can uh, come together um and you know be with each other so in as i shared in the beginning of the call uh this is rather one of the most uh, busiest times we've been having at um the uh, not just the regional office of uri but also around the world 
and um, some of the things that we have been doing um, at the North India Regional Office is um, so there are you know a, a lot of um, then it's divided into four categories. Um, the first is basically helping migrant uh, workers uh, because India being a developing country, we all have a large section of daily wage workers and migrants. And while this lockdown was announced, um, you know, most of them could not make it back home or their industries were just shut down. Um, most of them were dependent on everyday sources of income. And so there have been like a lot of issues uh, that majority of the population of India has been facing. So um, at our regional office, we have till date been able to uh, provide meals um, for almost two weeks to more than 6,000 people. Um, our, uh, and this is all through the benefit of the network where we have connected people, where we have pe connected people who can help to those who need help. And the beauty of this campaign has been that we've been able to reach the most marginalized communities, communities that are affected by HIV, um, uh, Hep C positive patients, people who have been previously uh, drug injecting users. And um, it's to them where our members, uh, cooperation circles are standing to, uh, you know, distribute food and uh, also gather resources to support uh, people who have not like probably almost eaten for good three four days so um, addressing hunger is one of the major tasks that uh, right now our regional office is involved in we have also been uh, doing a small campaign against fake news against uh, news which is um, uh, which basically promotes uh, the kind of uh, the uh, news which basically uh, promotes division in the society against specific religions uh, we and also specific races so we have been collating uh, ev uh, um, you know short stories every day which are easily easy to consume and read and circulate as well so this campaign has been running and we call it Corona to Corona. Uh, we, there are also, there is also um, meditation classes. There are uh, yoga classes that our members take. There are also mental health spaces that our cooperation circles are providing people so that they could, you know, share their anxieties, their fears. Um, there, uh, are also spaces where we're just collecting massive amount of data because there's so much on the WhatsApp universities these days, but we don't really know which one of it would be most helpful. So we're actually verifying information and um, you know broadcasting it so that people who need help can also reach out to sources which are reliable and verified. So um, these are some of the ones that we've been doing. Uh, I'm sharing with you some of the pictures uh, from very sensitive uh, spaces. And as you can see, there are long queues of people for uh, dry food and some of the situations where it's really deplorable. Um, these are some of the images from uh, our campaign. Uh, and there is, of course, so much more that a lot of the other regions around the world, 23 regional offices, as I mentioned, are doing. And uh, all of you in whichever part of the world you are, you can log on to www.uri.org and check out for more COVID related uh, updates. Last but not the least, uh, in this time uh, where I work with almost 75 cooperation circles, we are basically supporting them by connecting them to people who can directly provide them with any kind of resources uh, that, uh, uh, you know, could be helpful in uh, doing their relief work. Uh, we are also connecting them to relevant uh, news agencies, relevant um, government agencies who can also kind of 
bring awareness around the work. And so if people need to reach them out, they can definitely get connected. Um, we're also trying to do some um, online skill building work around how people can express themselves, how people can share small little simple life skills that they possess. Um, so these are some of the ways uh, that we've been supporting our member organizations here. Um, often a lot of times in all of this process, because you know, uh, while you are in lockdown and in your confinement, we are in a constant rush to see what can we do? How do we help others? Uh, how can we keep ourselves busy as well? Um, and how is it that I can still get back to our normal, like the normal that we've been trying to rush back at. So um, here are some of the ways that I would suggest uh, and bring from my own experiences. And if something works for you, please feel free to use any of these um, tips that I've collated. Uh, you can probably support a community with resources that is providing relief work around you. Um, in any part of the world, you can just go onto the URI map and check which is the closest member organization to you. And you know you can get connected and see if there's anything um, that is of common interest. So that's one. Second, you can be a bridge builder. Um, so the 6,000 people that we've been able to cater to with relief work has come out of zero money um, that URI has raised. We did not create a food bank. It was only through our network of stakeholders that were connected with each other. And that is the power of URI. So be a connector. Uh, you know, you know so many people and there's the WhatsApp university that works brilliantly. So I would suggest, um, you know, you definitely can um, you know connect people and it will just work um, very beautifully and trust me when you go to uh, sleep in the night um, it's one of the most rewarding things that you can imagine uh, collate information for working groups so we have as i mentioned there's a lot of data around you all the time and you're so glued to our screens check for verified information in your own communities, you can probably start um, a small little dissemination point where sharing simple uh, but reliable information can help. Um, you can also create spaces where you're checking against fake news because a lot of times, at least in India, it's also creating and there have been recent cases of violence where due to misinformation or previously um, or edited videos that were from the past uh, were have kind of uh, caused a lot of uh, social divide and strife amongst different religious communities and um, specifically given in the context of what had, had happened from the months of December till February in India, uh, this uh, religious divide is uh, also being used to further marginalize religious communities and not um, and you know like cutting them off from the kind of help that is available at this point in time so my request would only be just check for fake news and information and before you share on whatsapp um, be the change uh, you know that you would want to see you can start a small storytelling WhatsApp group. So share a story every day. Or uh, you can, in that storytelling group, you can also share maybe some of your skills like gardening, like a gardening video that you know you are doing these days, or a cooking recipe, uh, yoga, music, dance, um, anything that you're interested in. Uh, make your clan. Uh, and the last and the most important is take time out for yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of the community that you want to support. And my heart goes out to all people who have been really working day and night uh, to serve people. And so I just want them to know that you need to take care of yourself as well. And hence, um, while concluding this whole session, I just want to say 
at this point in time that from the cloud of isolation, fear, illness and death um, that has descended upon us, let us rediscover the, the power of social connecting and soul connecting. So let's not rush back to return back to our normal. Let's use this time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to and which aren't. So keep smiling, stay home, stay safe, stay healthy. And Thank you, you can you leave your comments in the section, um, in the chat section, and I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Supri, for concluding this presentation in a very positive uh, and energetic mood. Thank you for proposing all the tips and suggestions and advices on how we can contribute positively in, in addressing the ongoing crisis. Thanks to URI. And I would like to focus a little bit on the acronym URI, since I believe it is now, it is in times of crisis more than any time ever that we need to deal and we need to treat others as we treat others ourselves or as we want to be treated by others. You are I. If we treat them as they, they are ourselves, I think the world would be a better place to live in. So to summarize the main campaigns or activities that the URI as the largest interfaith community uh, working, uh, interfaith grassroots community working in interfaith harmony. We can summarize them uh, in the following points. First of all, providing food and uh, relief uh, and humanitarian uh, intervention to uh, the most needed part of the community, including to migrant workers and uh, vulnerable people like uh, HIV, HEP, or uh, those who are uh, on drug. Then uh, contributing positively in disseminating uh, positive news, co combating hate speech or fake news, and uh, by providing uh, the positive news about what's going on. And the other all uh, examples that you shared with us and how you are uh, reaching to thousands of people, uh, both in North India and in Pakistan. And I am sure all the attendees will benefit from your experience and they will try to replicate uh, your initiatives within their communities. And um, I'm sure we will have uh, more discussions based on Shahid's and yours presentation, focusing mainly maybe on that region of Pakistan and India at the end of the, the session. So without uh, delaying further now, let's move from the Far East to Far West to Latin, to Latin America, Argentina, where we have our dear fellow, one of the fellow's alumnus, uh, Rabbi uh, Marcelo Betar. And let me benefit from this time and invite all our attendees to have a look on the call for applications to the fellows program. I'm happy to share the link for the applications here as well. Rabbi Marcelo graduated from the fellows program in 2018 and uh, now he is uh, with us to be one of our esteemed speakers. Rabbi Marcelo, to give a, a, a small, uh, in a nutshell, to talk about him. Rabbi Marcelo is from Argentina, based in Argentina right now, basically is from the US. Uh, he is currently the rabbi of Dorjadash congregation in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Previously, he was the rabbi of Beth Israel Synagogue in Aruba and former rabbi of Temple Bet Israel in uh, Plantation, Florida, uh, in the U.S. So the floor is yours, Rabbi Marcelo. Thank you, Kvork. I want to thank Shahil and Suvi for the great uh, job that we are doing. Thank you, Kaisir. I want to say before talking about the COVID, I want to, to say to everybody, the participants, to, to join the fellow program from the Kaiser because really it's a great opportunity to learn and to create IRD programs and all kind of work in different countries. And I will start with the, the thing that Subi finished when she mentioned about normal life. What is normal life? That's a great question. 
because we have to start thinking if normal life was the one that we used to live until maybe here in Argentina, we are now a month in our homes. Right now we are 30 days that we have the quarantine, that we cannot go out, only just for groceries, for to go to the pharmacy, and that's it. We are the whole time, our normal life now is this one. So the world changed. The world changed a month ago or even more, and we are changing. And we have to change also. We don't have any other option because the world is moving the way that it will not be the same world as we lived two or three months ago. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I try to feel myself like I am living in a nightmare. Like this is just a bad dream. That it's not true that I cannot go out from my house. But the reality shows me that this is the real world. And this is the one that I am living now. And it's not only here in Buenos Aires or here in Argentina. It's also in Pakistan, in Vienna, and in all the countries that you are living there. It's in every place around the world. So we are living the same. So the COVID-19 is bringing us something that we don't used to think about. We are all equal on this. We are all the same for this virus. There are no rich people, poor people, good ones, bad ones. We are all the same. We are all equal. The streets are empty. It's like in a movie. Streets are empty. Very few people are walking. Walking with the mask that cover half of your, of your face. So that's the new reality. That's the, re the new normal life. But we don't want to get used to this life. So something we need to do. But so for now, living on this reality, so I start thinking I am a congregational rabbi. I'm a rabbi of a very big congregation here, a personal congregation, a congregation that we used to see each other face to face. We used to talk to each other face to face. We used to teach, to learn with kids, with adults, with seniors face to face. So now I have to change in one or two days everything to a virtual congregation, to an online congregation where all the technology, all these techniques, they are useful for me and for everybody in order to connect each other. So we can do this, this webinar from the Kaisid and thank to Kaisid because of this technology that we can get together and we can feel a little bit close at this new reality of this world. So questions like, what do I do as a religious leader in this time? How to, to face this new reality? How to bring comfort and hope to people that they are completely hopeless? How I can help other people in this uncertainty world? Because there is something that everybody knows, that is that we don't know anything about tomorrow. We live today, and that's the only thing that we can do. We don't know what's going on tomorrow. Nobody knows. Nobody knows in the, any part of the world. We are all the same. So understanding this, I realized for myself, and I understood that I have to be in contact with the people as much as possible. I didn't have any other option. That's what I wanted. That's what I feel myself that I can create something positive to other people. I need to be close to them as much as possible. So understanding my goal, I started with different proposals, initiatives that I, that I can fulfill my, my goal. Every day, for instance, every day at 11 in the morning here in Buenos Aires, 
I post a Facebook live video. Every day, 11 in the morning, 15 minutes, no more. But this kind of video, live, first, people, they see me and they understand and they realize that I am here for them. Second, I can create an interaction with people. Question, I always start asking, how are you? Good morning. What's going on today? How do you feel? So every, my, every morning, I do this 15 minutes video live on Facebook to reach out people and the congregation. Second, I started with the Zoom lectures like this, this webinar, Zoom classes, a platform that I've never heard before a month ago. I didn't know that even exists Zoom. And suddenly I am an expert on Zoom. Why Zoom? Because it's the only way that we can see each other. And we can see each other, and not only we see, we share our lives. I can share here, I can share and I can see the four of us. I can see your homes, you can see my home. So it's like, in a, in a way, it's like we are living in a kind of the Big Brother TV show. It's like each, each little screen, it's your own house. And we share our lives. We share our, our lives during the whole day, every day. So the Zoom platform brings us this possibility to share our lives. Then I, start with, I started every day making personal phone calls. I create a list, I write down a list of names with personal phone calls because I understood that people, they need to talk and I have to be a good listener and I have to be an active and very good listener because people, they need to be listened. They want to share what they are, how they are living this time, what they are doing this time. So in addition to the personal phone calls, I used to post to record videos, videos with different messages. For example, before Shabbat, every Friday, before the sundown, I share a video with a message for Shabbat for everybody with a song, with music, because I understand that music also, they create something nice to the spirit, to the soul of the people. So videos that I share in all kinds of social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, email, WhatsApp, everything. I use everything in order to share my thoughts and to be close to the people because now I have, we have a major problem. That is the distance. But the distance we can, we can make much closer when we feel connected. So we have to feel connected. In addition to the videos, for example, also it was Passover, a huge festival in the Jewish tradition, a few days ago. So we've reached to the people, to the families, to everybody with Passover messages. So everybody from different religions, they can understand the meaning and the things that we have in common, Passover, Easter, with different, with priests, with rabbis. We can create something together, a message together of coexistence. Also, we are working together with the government, with the worship department of the government. We are different religious leaders, we write articles in the newspapers, hope messages for the people, to bring hope, to bring a little bit of something nice that will happen in the future that we don't know yet. And another thing that I do with the government, together with the government, I am a volunteer. The government asks religious leaders for volunteers to make phone calls to anybody that they are in need, that they need someone to talk. So this phone chain, 
I am a volunteer for the government. So when someone wants to talk to a rabbi, for instance, they call me, they give me the phone number and I call them and we just talk. And this is important to talk. I understood now more than ever that crisis, crises are huge opportunities. The crises are opportunities. I am convinced that something we should learn from all of this. We should learn something from all this situation. We have to be the best version when we will go out from our homes. We should be the best version. We have to reach our potential as human beings. We have to be better ones. We cannot be the same ones as we started the quarantine a month ago, here in Argentina, for instance, or in your country, I don't know how many weeks already you are in quarantine. So what do I share with the people? What do I talk to the people? I try to bring hope. I try to understand and I try to show them because it's not only to the people, it's only to myself because I am the same as everybody feeling with the, with the fears, with everything. But I need to understand, I need to realize that something I need to learn and something we need to learn. I want to share with you that when God decided to give the Torah, the Torah is the five books of Moses. When God decided to give the Torah in the middle of the desert, the Midrash, an interpretation of the Torah, said that God went one by one of the people asking if they wanted the Torah. And all the people, they say, yes, but, yes, but they put a conditional, a condition in order to receive the Torah. When God arrived at the end to the Jewish people and asked if we want the Torah, the Jewish people, they answered, na seven ishma. That means we will do and we will listen. We will listen and we will do. And I think that it should be a huge motto today in our world, these two verbs, because we should listen to the health experts and we should do whatever they say, because it's for our best. In this time, we feel like there are no hope that we are living in, in the middle of the dark, in the middle of something obscure. We cannot see the future. But you know what? Remember the story of Noah, in the Ark of Noah, when the flood came, when the 40 days and 40 nights, it was raining. And Noah also thought that there was no future. How could the future be? So he said, okay, after the flood is over, the rainbow appeared again. So I can assure that the rainbow will appear again. And I will finish with the story. A story that it helped me a lot. A very well-known story about King Solomon. King Solomon was a very famous king in our tradition because he, he was a wise person. When God asked, what do you want? He said, I want to be a wise person. I want wisdom. So one day he tried to test. He tests his best loyal official. And he said, you know, I want you to buy me a ring, a special ring, a magic ring, a ring like this, but a magic one. The agent asked, what does it mean, a magic ring? And he said, you know, a magic ring is the one that when you put it and you are sad, you see the ring and you become happy. And the opposite, when you are so happy and you see the ring, you become a little sad. So the official went to all the jewelries and they asked, he asked for the magic ring. And of course, he couldn't find the magic ring. It was an impossible task for the official to get it. But at the end, before coming back to the palace, he had an idea and he said, I know what I will do. I will find the magic ring. He went to a jeweler and he said, I want a plain gold ring, a regular gold ring. And do me a favor, inscribe inside the ring this phrase, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. He came back to King Solomon and gave the ring. And he said, you know, 
everything in life will pass. Nothing is forever. Neither the good times nor the bad ones. And to finish, I recommend you to read the Little Prince book. This book for little ones, but it's not only for little ones. That the Little Prince book said, what is essential is invisible to the eyes. And what we can learn now is that relationship is the most important thing in our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Marcelo. As a religious leader, you demonstrated what kind of concrete steps a religious leader can take by presenting and sharing with all of us the steps that you have been taking to address the COVID-19 crisis, including but not limited to your Facebook Live videos on a daily basis, your personal phone calls with those who are in need so you don't lose, lose the contact with them, and you show them that you are in uh, constant contact with them and you didn't lose the contact, the videos that you are recording before Shabbat uh, on several issues, the communication and the coordination work with the worship department of the government. So you are volunteering in addressing the COVID-19 crisis by being part of the phone calls chain with all who are in need. And uh, thank you for uh, contributing to raise the hope within us that this also will pass soon. And we hope that we will go back to the normal life, which would definitely and should and must be better than the normal life that we used to live. So without further delay, I would like to open the space for the Q&A session uh, in the last 20 minutes of today's webinar. We have more or less 20 minutes and let me start the uh, question that was posed to all of you and feel free to start answering. The first question is the following. What have been your experience in putting theology as a communication tool on peace, harboring and getting participants understand each, other, uh, each other's religious practices and sensitivities? Can anybody answer? Yes, please go ahead, Supri. So uh, it has been quite a powerful tool, um, but I, there has it's always a there are two sides of the coin, and I would say that uh, if it is uh, wrapped and emboldened in the language of love, peace, and harmony, and if there is a, a sound uh, reading of the scriptures. Uh, because all the scriptures are interpreted in a lot of different ways. So um, if the scriptures are actually read from the point of view of love, peace and harmony, then it, it has been a very, very uh, successful and powerful tool to counter um, extremist and radical ideologies. Uh, on the other hand, if it is very selectively uh, interpreted, it can also be very disastrous. Um, that's one. And the other is that if we basically see uh, all religious ideologies from different value as value based education. So mm -hmm. the idea of service or seva from all in all different religions is actually the same, which is non discriminatory, uh, extending to all and uh, all religions talk about the same. So if the value centered um, religious reading or scriptures is read and disseminated. I think uh, that's again a very powerful tool. But the caution of it would only be that uh, it has to be well read and what also has to be all inclusive and not in one specific, um, rooted in one specific religion or sect. So that's my Thank point. you. Rabbi Marcelo or Shahid, if you want to answer this question as well, one of you. Yes, please go ahead, Shahid. So the, for us, like how are we considering uh, like our the the 
the very basic activity which we started from 10 years ago that was the diversity tours and that was a very famous idea in the west but uh, considering the reality of south asia and particularly pakistan like it was not a very familiar activity that going and sitting in a different religious places talking to them try to get the first hand information and try to understand their theology and try to find out the commonalities so when we started this like our diversity tours like we using the theology of commonalities like what all the religion and all the theology of the religions offering to each other like how we can understand and uh, each other and how we can not focusing on the differences rather than we focus on the commonalities which are a lot like so in our diversity to were like we the whole day our diverse faith 30 people they visit in the city different places sit together talk to them ask about what they do in the sunday mass and how they offer juma prayer and the what the sikh are doing and at the end of the day they sit together and they ask question that how much we are common and how much the theology of all these religion offering us to cooperate with each other. And that's really a powerful, like when the end of the day they come up, that's we have lot, lot things common. And rather than start from the differences, rather than focus on the commonalities, which our theology is uh, offering to us, and start from here and once we have a good relationship comfort zone a safe space let's talk our differences as well and try to to mitigate that as well so i i like and and my uh, understanding that the theology of commonalities is so powerful in, in this scenario Thank you. Thank you very much, Shahid. Rabbi Marcelo, uh, there is a specific question addressed to you. I would like to, uh, to pose that question. So the question says, what can we do to teach the religious leaders or to make them be aware of who are not yet to accept that this pandemic is fatal? Many of them in Nepal are still calling their followers to defy the lockdown and to worship in groups. Even though people can't go to their places of worship, they are still gathering at homes, secretly, in cities, and openly in villages. We don't have a big visible threat as of yet, but if, if it outspread severely, then it is going to be the religious leaders who will be exacerbate the situation. They represent almost all religions practiced here, majority, uh, majorly Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. So the question is very specific. How can we teach the religious leaders who are not yet ready to accept that this pandemic is a severe one? It's a good question. Uh, I will tell you something. There is no doubt that this the virus, the coronavirus, the COVID-19, it's something that for many people is fatal, that we finish in death. Uh, religious leaders cannot be uh, not aware of this. We should understand that all religions, there is something that is, the, to, in order to save a life, you can do whatever you can, do your, whatever you want to do, in order to save one life. There is something that in the Talmud, in the oral Bible, that we have that is, all human beings are responsible one for the other. We are responsible for one another. And it doesn't matter which religion we create, with religion, with color, with race, it doesn't matter. So really, if there are religious leaders that they are having gatherings, in their homes without taking care of the social isolation. It's something that it's not good at all because what religion is asking for is to take care of ourselves. Stay at home, hashtag stay at home around the world. So we are allowed now to use the Zoom platform in order to pray together. 
something that a month ago, it was prohibited. But today around the world, we decided that this is the only tool that we can get together because it's dangerous to get together in person. And that's what we miss. We miss to get together. I cannot say no. Of course we miss. Everybody misses this. Everybody misses the family. Everybody misses a hug, a kiss, everything. But that's what we have to do. We shall listen and we shall do. Thank that's you. That's what we have to do. Thank you. The next question uh, is partly answered by you and Shahid. Uh, this is why I would like to address it to uh, specifically to Subhi. The question is how local authorities collaborate with your organization during the lockdown and what kind of challenges you are facing or you might face during delivering the assistance uh, to the people? Um, so, we are the local authorities, both the um, religious faith-based organizations, um, other civil society organizations, government institutions, uh, and the bureaucracy has been actually working in tandem with each other and have been by and large very, very supportive. Uh, I think it's for me one of those spaces where people have cut across all divides to come together to serve people so we have not actually really faced so much of challenge on that side but the kind of um, challenges we face are a that mobility is highly restricted uh, b there is so much of uh, hunger and poverty uh, issues at this point in time that every time there is a distribution that has to happen, even if we follow all the social distancing norms, people gather because they've not eaten food in three, four, or maybe more number of days. So, you know, it, catering to the need of the people, I think is a really big challenge. Alternatively, uh, because as I said that we've been working across through a network, raising resources and then uh, coordinating between how it will be picked up, by whom, what time, how will the passes be arranged, who will deliver it and ensuring that equitably it's being distributed because there are also these um, some few odd cases which are trying to disrupt the whole process uh, either by holding on it either uh, by collecting only from themselves and not sharing it with others um, or also uh, duplicating names so there are some you know very few fake cases that we have also come across so the idea of equitable distribution um, at the same point in time ensuring the safety of the people who are distributing it because we are also exposing those workers to you know, so many different people. So I think these are some of the logistical challenges in terms of coordination, procurement and distribution that we have, not so much in terms of uh, you know, people coming together, not so much in terms of uh, um, the authorities per se. Thank you, uh, thank you, Supri. Uh, since we are running out of time, I would like to apologize from all those who post questions, but we are not able to answer them in the public. But I will kindly invite the speakers to address these questions privately if they are addressed to them. You, you can do so. Meanwhile, I would kindly ask you to wrap up the session by delivering your uh, final remarks within uh, one minute more, one minute more or less. Who would like to start? Maybe Shahid, the same order that we started the session. Yeah, so the, I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, although the time of crisis, but it's giving us a lot of things to learn more in a different way and that, that how we can promote uh, the, the, uh, the sense of belongings to each other and how we can help people and how we can think creatively to, to work in a, the very tense situations. 
So I think it's, I consider it's an opportunity, like it's crisis, it's really a difficult time, but this is opportunity, like how we can do things differently. And this is, the, and I, I believe this is a once time opportunity because this, these things will pass soon and things will be over and the life will be normalized after the, like a couple of weeks. And I, I hope as soon as possible or the couple of months, but this would be the time when we can say that when the time was crisis, I manage it and I give my best and I try to do something differently and I help people and promote the self of belongings to each other and the, the promote the, uh, the sense of one community of this world. So thank you. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll just read this uh, quote that has been motivating me and it says perhaps the strongest people are the ones who possess the power to heal themselves and be whole again so I just wish more uh, power more uh, self-care um, more hope to each one of you and just knowing the fact that we're all so deeply connected as human beings. Uh, I just want to thank each one of you for joining us today and Kaisi for organizing this uh, wonderful webinar uh, and giving me the opportunity to share, uh, you know, whatever little work that we've been doing. It's absolutely been an honor and a privilege. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Supri. And Marcelo, last but not least, definitely. Thank you. Uh, in the first century, the students asked to one rabbi, a very, a very famous rabbi, to Rabbi Akiva, what is the most important thing in the whole Bible? And he was thinking and thinking, and at the end, he united all his students and he said, you know, there is only one sentence, only one sentence, that is the most important one in the whole Bible. Love your fellow like yourself. We need to love each other. It doesn't matter which religion, it doesn't matter the faith, the creed, anything. We are all one and we should be loved and love to each other like we love yourself. Stay at home and keep safe. And thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, Kvore and Kaisid and everyone. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, before. Before concluding this webinar, uh, I would like to thank everyone who attended this webinar. And I would like to inform you and invite you to join our next webinar this Friday uh, on the 23rd of April at 11 a.m. Vienna time or uh, Central European time. The topic will be, we will be discussing resilience of uh, we will be discussing the fostering resilience and tolerance in Rohena state in Myanmar. So please share this information with your colleagues. So we have uh, attendees specifically uh, interested to learn more about Myanmar and what's going on in the Rohena state. But, and at the end, I would like to really thank all the speakers for their valuable inputs for their positive vibes and uh, the energy that they brought into this webinar. Um, at the end, I believe that this is a challenge for all of us and we should embrace this challenge. This is not the first pandemic the humanity is facing. Throughout the history, there were lots of pandemics deadlier than this one maybe, I don't know. But I'm sure that there were lots of pandemics and this will not be the last. But the most important thing that we need to embrace this challenge and turn it into an, an opportunity. So once we are done with it, we get to a normaler life, way better than the normal life that we used to live uh, before this crisis. So I wish you all the best. I repeat all the advice to stay home, to be connected with your beloved ones and uh, stay healthy, stay home. We are with you, we will continue being with you and we will continue providing similar platforms to discuss these issues. And as always, the religion 
all religions have constructive role to play in addressing this pandemic. Thank you very much and have a good night or good morning wherever you are uh, connecting uh, us. Thank you. Thank you.